For some, it was the most important promise the federal Liberal Party made in the last election. The promise that we just had our last ever election conducted under First Past the Post. Electoral reform was on. But those folks have now been sorely disappointed as the government backed off that promise, citing a lack of consensus about what reform should look like. However, that has not ended the conversation. A new collection of essays, Should We Change How We Vote? Evaluating Canada's electoral system takes up that debate, and we're pleased to welcome two of its contributors tonight. Joining us now in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Melissa Williams, Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto and currently Senior Visiting Scholar at Harvard University, and in Kingston, Ontario, Elizabeth Goodyear Grant, Associate Professor in Political Studies at Queen's University. Delighted to welcome you both to TVO tonight, and why don't we just get started, uh, Elizabeth, with um, a question about the current system under which we operate. We hear a lot of criticisms about First Past the Post. Do you think it's earned those criticisms? Uh, well, um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, all electoral systems have their strengths and drawbacks. And many of the criticisms of the current First Past the Post system are legitimate and serious. And um, maybe especially serious since they seem to be feeding into uh, a fair bit of public um, debate about whether the institutions represent the will of Canadians and, and whether the institutions produce good governance. So I take those criticisms very seriously, yes. Melissa, what would you say is the uh, most egregious problem with First Past the Post, our current system for electing governments? Well, I'd like to put in a little perspective. You know, when I look at the range or the hierarchy of, of problems in the Canadian political system, I probably wouldn't put the first past the post electoral system at the top of the list of the things we need to address. I mean, I would put at the top of the list Canada's relationship with Indigenous people. I think that's the most morally urgent problem that the country has to face and will have to face for some time. And then when we're looking at democratic institutions, I'd say, well, is first past the post worse than an unelected Senate? Uh, that's kind of a democratic embarrassment. But, but then when we come to first past the post, yeah, I agree with Elizabeth. I think there are some problems with it. One of the biggest problems is that it, uh, it systematically underrepresents uh, small parties, women, visible minorities, indigenous people. And, and so that I, I take very seriously as a moral flaw in a democracy when certain groups are systematically underrepresented in the political process. Um, there's also the problem, the kind of flip side of that is that uh, first past the post systems exaggerate electoral pluralities and majorities. Um, and that can create the problem of false majority governments, uh, which in a parliamentary system is fairly serious because majority governments have quite a lot of power to push their agendas through. So when they're doing that and haven't got the electoral support of a majority of the population, um, then that creates, I think, uh, it, it contributes to broader voter disaffection with the political process. Um, so. There are a few other things I might mention, but I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. Sure, let's hold off there for a moment because we, we want to follow up on some of those. Elizabeth, let's let's tackle some of that. The notion that the current system systematically underrepresents various groups in society, and you heard Melissa offer a bit of a list there. Do you think that's true? Well, there's no doubt that the current system does systema systematically underrepresent women. So women are currently 25% of uh, elected members of parliament in Canada and in fact for the past like 15 to 20 years it's been hovering between 20 to 25 percent. Um, Can I just jump in there? Why is that yes. why is that reflective of a system that systematically underrepresents women as opposed to the fact is just way more men than women run? Uh, well th the first past the post system has some features in it which um, I mean, you probably wouldn't say that they discourage women from running, but compared to other systems like mixed systems and PR systems, they make it more difficult to achieve various types of balance on the electoral ticket. So because we only have one candidate per party per riding or, and one member elected per riding, it means that ticket balancing is really difficult and therefore bringing in things like um, 
you know, candidate quotas and so on are quite difficult. So it's some of the features of the system that don't um, produce as gender equitable um, electoral results. Um, on the issue of uh, racial minorities and indigenous people, they actually aren't currently underrepresented numerically in any case in Canada's House of Commons. As of the last federal election, we have um, proportionality in the proportion of racial minorities sitting in the House of Commons and the proportion in the population at large. So that's just an interesting sort of point to consider. Um, yeah, I'd I would like also to jump in on that a little bit. I think it, it, it is true that um, visible minority representation in Parliament uh, after the 2015 election, using that, that awkward term that we use in, in uh, Canadian statistics, um, mm. it is true that, that that's much closer to proportionality than it's been in the past. Um, it's also true that the, there's a higher level of Indigenous representation. We now have a record high number of 10 Indigenous representatives, which is 3% of the parliament. Now, that's still not quite pr proportional. The official numbers for the uh, indigenous population uh, is 4.3%. So it's still an underrepresentation. The, the broader issue is that that result, where we've had now a record number of women, a record number of minorities, a record number of indigenous MPs, um, may be a fluke. It's not written into the system. It may not get re reproduced in the future. So we shouldn't take too much encouragement from it. Quick follow-up to you, Melissa. Uh, Kim Campbell, the former Prime Minister, has floated the idea of having two MPs per riding, one man, one woman, and that way you'd get gender parity instantly. What do you think of that idea? I think it's a great idea. Um, I, I think there's, there's really no reason not to suppose that political talent is at least equally distributed across the sexes. And uh, so I, I think that's a, a, a great way of overcoming the sort of systemic barriers to women's representation. And of course, they, they do have a parity requirement in, in, in France. Um, I think there are some persuasive arguments for it. Elizabeth, a quick uh, comment from you on that? Um, I mean, in principle, I mean, I support that sort of thing, although I also know that uh, electoral backlash against reserve seats is often quite strong. Um, so, I mean, I think there would probably be uh, less difficult ways. I mean, candidate quotas, because the research has shown, so I'm a scholar principally of elections and political behavior, and the research has shown that once women are on the ballot, they win basically uh, their win rate is the same as men. So getting women on the ballot is really the key thing. I mean, and on the, I mean, Melissa mentioned the issue of France too. France is a sort of interesting example where they have the parity laws. It's written into the constitution and the parties regularly, routinely ignore it. France is one of the, the worst mm -hmm. countries in the world on women's representation at the um, mm -hmm. national level. Mm -hmm. So I think the point in, in me bringing that up is that all these mechanisms we have, whether it's reserved seats or constitutional uh, parity laws or changes in the electoral system, none of this guarantees greater equity and representation for women, um, racialized people, or indigenous. I mean, it, it all comes down in many cases to questions of political will. Well, to that end, let me quote from Ken Carty, who also wrote a couple of the essays in the book that uh, you have out now, Should We Change How We Vote? Here's what Ken says. The simple truth is that across three provinces, in three referendums, the voters turned down the proportional alternative. Only in British Columbia, and then only the first time, did the yes vote ever exceed 50%. With none of the established party leaders championing reform, voters apparently were not convinced of the need to abandon first past the post for something new. Melissa, pick up on that if you would. Uh, first past the post gets a lot of criticism, some of the criticisms you've put on the record here in our conversation. But the fact is, anytime we've done anything formal to look at something different, the voters have said, actually, we're okay with the way it is. Why do you think? Well, I, I like to put a bit of a more positive spin on what Ken Cardi wrote, which is that there have been all of these experiments in electoral reform across Canada in recent years. And I think uh, that's really good news in itself. I think that we don't have these kinds of 
debates unless democracy is already in a pretty healthy state. It's understandable that voters are wary of electoral systems that they're not familiar with. First past the post is all they've known. And, uh, and so it's uh, when the alternatives are relatively unknown and you're, they're quite complex sometimes to understand, I can understand why, my, why voters might be a little bit wary. That said, though, um, it does bear repeating that in the uh, first referendum on the BC proposal for switching to a form of proportional representation, it got 58% of the vote. Uh, and it only didn't win because they had set a 60-60 threshold uh, mm -hmm. for, for, the, uh, for the passage of that. Um, I was looking at an Enveronics poll from last year, which uh, asked people what's wrong with the political system. And when it came to electoral reform, 41% of the respondents said uh, that first past the post needs to be, uh, needs to be changed. That uh, was a plurality. That was the biggest response of any, of any group. Um, and I think it, we're, it, it bears, uh, we, it, it bears uh, repeating again that uh, 41%. Now, that's a familiar figure because that's precisely the plurality by which the liberal majority government uh, got its majority of seats in Parliament. So I think that we shouldn't underestimate that there is some popular appetite for this out there, and also that just having the conversation has been quite healthy. Sure. Melissa, one of the, the um, or excuse me, let's go to Elizabeth on this. One of the criticisms uh, that I have heard is that, um, and it was certainly the case in 2007 in Ontario, the, the government sort of put it out there. We're going to have a referendum. We're going to consider a different system. Uh, it may be really complicated, and we're really not going to spend a heck of a lot of time or money explaining to people what's on offer. In other words, we've made our commitment to offer a, a different democratic alternative, but that's it. Is that a fair criticism in your view? Yeah, I mean, the Ontario example is a good one on that criticism because the government, uh, I mean, in many corners, um, the government was criticized for a lack of attention to public education around the referendum and the issues at stake. Right. And not only that, but also the deliberative democratic process that had occurred prior. So the Citizens' Assembly that had, had occurred prior to assess the various um, alternatives and to deliberate and, you know, with uh, members drawn from every riding in the province. So, but I, I mean, just like the BC referenda and the Ontario referendum, maybe this speaks to the folly of holding these important referendum questions during general elections, because that's what happened in all of these cases. Mm -hmm. The referendum was just one relatively ignored aspect um, compared to the provincial election campaign, and it sort of got lost in the shuffle, perhaps. Melissa, you want to follow up? Yeah, I think the, uh, the process as it f unfolded in, in BC and Ontario, again, I'd like to put a positive spin on that. I think we learned a tremendous amount from the citizens' assembly processes in both British Columbia and Ontario. Uh, we mm -hmm. learned a lot of positive lessons about how to do those well. I think the basic idea of using a citizens' assembly for uh, uh, reaching judgments, public judgments about electoral reform is an excellent idea because it takes the, the judgment out of the hands of elected officials who, by definition, have a stake in the system as it exists. So I mm -hmm. think it's a great idea. And it, uh, when you've got a representative sample of citizens, that serves as a really good proxy. They have the time to really think through what the different options are and to solicit the information they think they need to, to reach a good judgment. That's a really good uh, proxy for the judgment of ordinary citizens. Both processes really fell down on the public education uh, stage of the, of the agenda, and so there was uh, a, a real gap between the deliberations, the real high-quality deliberations in the Citizens' Assembly, and the very low-quality public discussion that, that led into the uh, referendum. So I think that basic model is a really good one, but it, we, we need to learn from those processes to invest a whole lot more at the public education stage before going to referendum. Elizabeth, having said that, let's do one more comment here on First Past the Post, and then we'll get on to proportional representation, and that's this. You know, we elect governments at the end of the day to make decisions. And if you can get a majority government on the basis of getting 39, 40, 41 percent of the votes, uh, you have, in fact, elected, um, you know, 
uh, you've elected a government that has the ability to make decisions. Uh, I mean, is there something to be said for that? Well, um, this is one of the aspects of the chapter that I wrote for the collection. And uh, so on state management and government performance criteria, uh, first past the post does tend to have an edge. And I mean, that's not just me saying that, but that's the literature. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good consensus. The other flip side of the decision making and the sort of uh, ability to act and, and, you know, possession of a mandate in that sense, although maybe there's some problems with the wider mandate, which is one of the arguments. And there's the accountability piece, right? So if you have a single party that has the ability to act based on a blueprint that was shopped during the election campaign, the, the, the lines of responsibility then are quite clear. And so I make this sort of more complicated argument in the book about why that's important for Canadians and for democratic citizens everywhere, to be able to, to tell who is in charge, who's responsible for this legislative agenda, and who do we hold to account uh, if we judge it to fall short. Now, Melissa, of course, the, the, the key principle at stake in proportional representation is, you know, if you get 40% of the votes, you're entitled to 40% of the seats. If you get 60% of the votes, you're entitled to 60% of the seats, and so on. Um, the people who are in favor of that formula, uh, you know, I say this, I guess, a little facetiously, seem to think that that idea came down from Mount Sinai and that it's somehow be so obvious <laughs> as to be beyond debate. <laughs> Is that, in fact, so obvious to be beyond debate and therefore we really should go to this system? Uh, no, I don't think it's so obvious as to be beyond debate, but I think it is worth noting that uh, in recent decades, uh, very few new democracies have actually chosen, a few if any, and I haven't double-checked the, the, the facts on this, maybe Elizabeth can fill me in, uh, but I think that there have been very few, if any, uh, new democracies that have chosen first past the post as their preferred electoral system. There are uh, a lot of, uh, and I, I think that's because uh, there is a strong intuition that representing the, the voters in an equitable way is both fairer and to come back a bit against what, um, in response to what Elizabeth said about the, the virtues of first past the post in, in, uh, in generating governments that have a clear mandate, that have the, the capacity to, to govern decisively and to be held responsible for their decisions. In theory, that is the, the, the greatest virtue of a first-past-the-post system, that it generates majority governments that then can rule decisively and responsibly. Um, the argument against PR is that all of the, the brokering of policy agendas happens after the election uh, in the coalition formation process, because there's very seldom a majority government under a PR system. Uh, and, and that is a failure of transparency to the voters. They don't know in advance what agenda they're voting for because they don't know exactly how the coalition is going to shape up. But in fact, so that's true in theory um, with respect to both systems. But in practice, if we look at the Canadian, the Canadian system and its uh, party system, in theory, a first-past-the-post system is only supposed to generate, you know, usually two major big tent centrist parties. In Canada, because of regional diversity, east and west and north and south, um, and for other reasons, we've got five uh, parties in our federal system. And in fact, uh, overall, it hasn't produced majority governments with nearly the frequency that we would predict from the theoretical model. So in fact, minority governments do happen and they do have to forge coalitions and negotiations and make bargains and after the, after the election. Um, so, um, and a further a kind of a further point in, in favor of PR is that it puts those negotiations um, about around policy agendas right in the heart of the parliament. This is an argument that Mark Warren makes in his contribution to the volume, and I think it's an interesting one. So it, it brings more, uh, it, it forces parties to actually find common ground on policy agendas, and that might contribute to the stability of policy and ultimately uh, increase sort of the capacity of government to really move forward over the longer term on the policy issues that there's broad consensus need to be addressed. In contrast, a first-past-the-post system 
means that a, a small change in the vote can generate a, a total change in government, which means that you get big policy shifts from one uh, government to the other, uh, and new governments spend a lot of time undoing what the previous government did. Uh, so there may be a kind of efficiency and effectiveness argument as well as a fairness argument to make for PR. That is true, uh, but uh, Elizabeth, let me get you to comment on this aspect of it. If I hear uh, one major criticism of proportional representation, it is, do we really want to have a kind of pizza parliament like Italy has, or do we really want the kind of system that Israel has, both of which, um, you know, offer, it seems, much less stability than what we have here, uh, and a lot more influenced by small, smaller parties, um, and where you get to the point, as in Israel, where there are negotiations for all sorts of very minor picayune things upon which a government can fall. That's not part of the Canadian tradition. Do you think it should be? Um, I mean, I think those examples are, are, I mean, probably not that productive for discussion in the Canadian example, and uh, in the Canadian setting, to be honest. I mean, those are the most extreme examples of highly fractured party systems and at times highly dysfunctional um, government mechanics as a result. Like, um, so, I mean, in general, I think it's probably not all that um, fair to take the most extreme example of anything and sort of say, is this what we want? Because in reality, that's probably not what we, what we would get. I mean, the other point to raise here in this discussion is that in my sense of the public debate, and I think this would be true for a lot of people, I don't think a pure PR system was ever really on the table. It hasn't been, at least in the provincial investigations and recommendations for electoral reform. And watching the electoral reform process unfold last year in Canada, it, it, I, I never really got the sense that pure PR that could produce a pizza parliament uh, in the most extreme case was really on the table. We were talking about some sort of mixed system or a, a transition potentially to a system that would be uh, something other than pure PR. So like, uh, you know, like a ranked ballot or, or something like this. So, I mean, I take your point and I think it's valid, uh, but I think we're sort of imagining the worst and it's not very probable and, and probably shouldn't be used to scare Canadians about electoral reform. Because at the end of the day, what we do want are the best institutions to produce the best outcomes for Canadians and to enhance their confidence in governmental processes. And so if electoral reform does produce that, Great, um, but we shouldn't be using, like, I think, extreme examples to, to make people afraid about it. Well, well, that's what we do in journalism. We give the most oh, egregious what? examples and try to scare people into... Anyway, no, I'm just I'm kidding well, on that one. Well, we do that in political science, too, sometimes. <laughs> I'd just like to add one thing to what Elizabeth said, which I totally agree with, um, which is district magnitude. So how many parties a proportional representation system generates depends entirely on... Uh, how large the, the districts are, how many candidates you're running in a given district. In Israel, the whole country is a single district, and so that's why that particular extreme form of PR generates so many small uh, mm -hmm. and, and fringe parties. So we, we have quite a lot of control over how many uh, parties uh, the system will generate by uh, controlling the, the size of the districts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let, with just a couple of minutes left here, I want to give each of you a magic wand. We know that when Justin Trudeau was given that magic wand before the last election, he said, there's no more first past the post. That's the last election we've done. We're going to go to a different democratically reformed system next time. And because he says there was no consensus out there for change, status quo is where it's at. Okay. Each of you has the magic wand. Elizabeth, to you first. Give me about a minute, each of you, on if you could change the current system by which we elect our politicians in this country to something else, what would the Elizabeth Goodyear grant system look like? I mean, so just with the proviso that I'm not certain I would change it, um, if I had to change it, I would probably recommend a form of ranked balloting that would allow greater choice for Canadians in the expression of their political preferences it would have the ability to produce a government that does indeed have majority support in the electorate while maintaining the strong history and, and uh, for me, um, important history of decisive single-party government um, 
you know, with all those accountability mechanisms to the people. And I would also add that if I had my magic wand and it was, you know, full reign, carte blanche, I probably wouldn't tackle electoral reform as my first democratic reform um, No, I piece. get that. But that's, but again, here, the, the evils of journalism okay, force this upon it. you. They're so your that was rules. The, I'm, I'm okay. with you. Exactly. I, I, I get to set the conditions here. Okay, the Melissa Williams system of electoral reform looks like what? It looks much more like the New Zealand system, uh, which is a mixed member proportional system, which has the advantage of relatively small districts so that people still feel some connection to their elected uh, uh, representatives. But another feature of the New Zealand system, which I think is uh, really important, is that they have a, a system for Maori representation that we might emulate. Um, mm. in, in that system, they combine mixed member pro proportional representation with some uh, uh, reserved seats for, for Maori, which enhances Maori representation in, in the parliament. That may not be the best way of in addressing indigenous underrepresentation, but if I've got one shot at a reform that would at least help, uh, that might be it. Well, I can definitely say this. You both have my votes, whichever system we end up putting in place. And I want to thank both of you Aww. for coming on TVO tonight and sharing your views on this. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Steve. And thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Melissa. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.